What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Elix 2. To give my usual spiel real quick, I review games after 100% pretty often, which does mean more than just the achievements, and if you're curious what all it entails and you're new to the channel, if you click my channel, the first video you're going to see is a video explaining everything and everything that I cover. Furthermore, my Steam profile is linked in the description and it is public, feel free to check it out. Now that said, Elix 2 is of course the sequel to the original Elix, and it is a direct sequel. That means it is very hard to talk about Elix 2 without spoiling the first game. And while I'm not going to spoil the second game, it is pretty much unavoidable that I spoil the first game. So bear that in mind. Now Elix 2 is from developer Piranha Bytes, which is known for a very particular style of game. Moreover, their games tend to fall into the category of what is affectionately called Eurojank which are largely AA games that lack a certain amount of polish, but are known for being very good nonetheless. Now exactly like Elix 1, Elix 2 is an open world RPG that carries forward pretty much all of the main mechanics, so in that way the games are very similar, but Elix 2 refines and changes a few things, but the open world combat and exploration and the core mechanics of the game really remain the same. Now to give a basic story setup that again is going to spoil the entirety of the first game, we have to first understand the canon ending of the first game. So the original game had, I believe it was three endings off the top of my head, as well as some other choices that didn't factor into the specific ending, but have been carried forward into the next game. There is no save file import or anything, so these decisions just are what they are in the second one. And that's important because this sees us taking the sort of default ending for the first game in that we toppled the hybrid, and some more important decisions like romancing Kaya, which was one of the companions from the main game. And that's especially important because in the six or seven years between Elix 1 and 2, Kaya and Jax had a child, which plays an important role in the second game. Now, there are a number of other decisions as well that are also canonicized in how you could handle certain quests. However, they are much more granular than they are integral to the main plot of the game. But in the six or seven years that it has been since the first game, Jax attempted to unite all of the factions that were present in their fight against the incoming invasion that we learn about at the end of the first game. However, that fails miserably. Jax imposes a bit of a self-exile and leaves Kaya, his son, and a lot of other people just behind. He doesn't really talk to anybody. He just kind of lives out in the woods by himself. Until, of course, the invaders arrive. Jax's hideout is hit by this invasion, so he comes face to face with these creatures fairly quickly, and in order to fight the invasion, he has to then gather up his resources, unite the factions, and fight off this invasion that everyone knew was coming. And a large part of the game revolves around uniting these factions who have notoriously not wanted to work together. But moving on a bit, we talk about Jax. Jax is the set protagonist. It just kind of is what it is. You do have the choice to build him into a character build that you want him to be, however. And this largely takes place through stats that any RPG fan would be familiar with. Raising these attributes will give you points in your appropriate stats that are related to it. And that's how you get stronger as well as spending your learning points as you level up on new abilities. Every time you level up, you're going to get 10 attribute points and one learning point. However, that is a restriction that this game has made largely meaningless. In the first game, we saw a cold system that would largely act as a karma system in some ways, but would you act cold and logical or show more emotion? In this game, that has been replaced with a destruction system, which largely works the same way, they just changed the name. However, the actual physical material of Elix can be used in potions, etc. to make people stronger, which is what makes people cold and logical if they take too much of it. It kind of just strips them of their emotion. And in the original game, taking too much Elix would make you stronger, but it would lock you into the bad ending of the game. However, that's all been removed in this game, so you can drink all of the Elix potions and stuff that were present in the original, but now there's no downside to doing so. And these Elix potions can give you extra attribute points as well as extra learning points, which means if you grind out enough Elix potions, regardless of your level, you can just max out everything, which will take some work, but it's very doable. Now beyond that, again, we can spend our learning points in various skill trees, if you will. In order to learn these, however, we have to go find a trainer who can teach us the relevant skill. And I do mean find, because they are not just marked on your map. You have to talk to people, figure out what they know, and then open them up as a trainer. And this saw a few changes from the original as well. In the first game, we just saw four trainers for each type of skill, combat, survival, 
personality or charisma. In the sequel here, we have a system where trainers will know certain parts of each skill tree, which makes a bit more sense if that's what you're going for anyway and having to come find a trainer and learn this stuff from them. It makes sense that they would not just know every type of combat, etc. So in that way, I kind of like that expansion a bit, but it is nonetheless a change from the first game. But from there, let's move on to world building a little bit. So there have been a lot of changes in Magalon, including how they pronounce the name of the planet, which is Magalon. So in the first game, they pronounced it both Magalan and Maglan. And in this game, they just decided to pronounce it Magalon. So here we go. But beyond that, functionally speaking, the world building makes up of half of the previous map from the original, as well as a new part of the map that wasn't in the original. So if you're familiar with the Tavar Desert in the original game, that has now become the Tavar Forest, as the Berserkers, who were the canonical faction that Jax joined in the original game, then took over the Tavar Desert from the outlaws and pushed them out. And they turned this desert, using their mana and magic, into a desert. So even though you're going to be familiar with the area, it will have changed a bit. And I personally got a lot of pleasure out of roaming around and then suddenly realizing that I knew where I was but there were just trees here now. And that was kind of a cool revelation that I wanted to share with everybody. But a lot of the world building is done through finding out what happened to all of the factions after the ending of the original game, how they've been doing in the last several years, how all of the faction infighting has caused them to kind of splinter and not have a ready defense for the coming invasion, despite them knowing about it well in advance. Now, if you're unaware or you haven't been paying attention to the footage, I suppose, Elix itself is a sort of blend of high fantasy and science fiction. So all of the factions are some kind of in-between there. So the planet of Magalon, before it was hit by a comet that brought the Elix and thus caused a sort of post-apocalypse, was a fairly similar planet to Earth. A lot of technology, cities, cars, etc. So there's a certain amount of technology going on. But the Elix that the comet brought is a sort of power source that the Berserkers have learned to turn into mana, which they can cast actual magic with. So you see an interesting dichotomy of technology versus this more magic-focused society. So we get to do things like use a jetpack to traverse the world while simultaneously having a companion that can shoot fireballs. Now the jetpack is one of the unique features of Elix, I would say, or something that they kind of really lean into in that it allows a certain freedom of exploration as you traverse the world. And they included in this particular title, which wasn't in the first one, a bunch of upgrade options for the jetpack. So you can increase its usefulness as well as even take part in jetpack combat. However, you do have to weigh that against what I'm about to tell you, because while this isn't a spoiler, when you finish the game, you get given this ability called Jetpack Master, which just completely maxes out your jetpack. You can use it indefinitely at all the time, which turns your character into Superman, basically, where you can literally just fly across the map and then wrap up all your collectibles, etc., whatever you want to do. So you can keep playing after the credits roll, so to speak, and then just hoover up everything with your new jetpack master talent, which honestly was pretty cool, so I wanted to mention it. Now, before we jump into the factions, let's talk a bit about the graphics of this game. They're real hit or miss. On one hand, the actual world looks a lot better than the original title. Not that the original one looked bad, but there's been some obvious improvements. Now, the kind of balance that that finds itself in is that the faces during conversations are real hit or miss. Sometimes they look pretty good. Other times they look really weird. And I would tell you that it bounces just back and forth. There's some scenes where the face animations are fine. And then there's conversations where the faces look like they're from a different game entirely compared to the rest of the world. So just real hit or miss there. But with that out of the way, let's talk factions. Now, all the factions from the original game are in this one with the addition of one more. And we can actually join all five of these factions. In the original game, we could only join three out of the four. Now, that said, I would say there are three major factions and two minor ones. And unique to this game, we can choose not to join a faction at all. But that said, your destruction level does play a role in this, and some factions require you to have a certain minimum or maximum amount of destruction in order to join their faction. But we've already mentioned the Berserkers. These are the mages that I mentioned. Then there are the Albs, A-L-B-S. They are a almost different race of human beings at this point that have taken so much elix that they've become cold and logical. And since the ending of the original game, they have cut back on their Elix consumption because it kind of turned them into slaves to the hybrid, which we overthrew in the first game. So the Albs have been experimenting with allowing themselves to feel emotion here and there, though they are still taking Elix to make themselves stronger and faster, etc. 
and these people have noticeably almost pale white skin, so they stand out. However, if they stop taking Elix, their skin will eventually return to normal color. Then we have the clerics from the original game. The albs actually originated from the clerics. The clerics are a very technologically advanced society, just like the albs are. However, the clerics are like the moral opposite. They are good people who believe in helping everyone they can in the name of their god, Kalan. However, in the first game, we found out information that proved Kalan was the name of a rocket ship that was designed to save people from the disaster that didn't actually work. And the leaders of the clerics know this, but they still believe in the concept of Kalan. And for whatever reason, it seems like not everyone understands that Kalan is not literally a god. They seem to still be kind of passing that off or just letting people believe it. So there's that. You cannot join the clerics straight away because the clerics are actually one of the minor factions. In order to join the clerics, you first have to join the albs. And then there is a quest that will lead you to joining the clerics if you want to from the albs which is something that's similar that the outlaws do, which we'll get into here in just a second. The brand new faction is a faction called the Morcons. They are new because they're descended from people who actually descended underground when the extinction level event happened above that caused the post-apocalypse. So they've been living underground until very recently. However, these people are cultists, for lack of a better word. They believe in a blood god. They believe that death is oblivion, even if they don't necessarily want to die. And basically, they're very destructive, they're very warmongering, and they're outright trying to kill a lot of the other factions, and part of the game is kind of dealing with that situation. However, you can join them. I will say their armor and their general aesthetic looks very cool, so I could see why you would, but it's definitely your kind of bad guy faction. And then we have the outlaws. The outlaws are bandits. They are in a bad way, much like the clerics, actually, because the Outlaws used to control the fort, which the berserkers now control before they ousted the outlaws. The clerics are actually also in a bad way because the albs ousted them out of their home in Ignadon, where the main invasion happened. So the albs, rather than work with the clerics, just kind of kicked them out of their capital city in order to use all of the resources to fight the invasion themselves. Again, cold logical people. But in order to join the outlaws, you have to either first join the berserkers or the Morcons. And then there is a quest that will lead you to potentially joining the outlaws. Now, there's quite a few factions. There's a lot of interactions. But I will say, much like the first game, a lot of the coolest part of the factions go into getting to the point where you can be recruited. And then after you become part of that faction, there are several quests which see you moving up the ranks of said faction. But in terms of what it does for the main story, which does push you to join a faction, it really doesn't change that much. Like, it's definitely fun and an option, so I don't want to knock it, but it really doesn't change that much in the grand scheme of things for the main story. Because in this game, there's not a bunch of endings like there is for the original. There's just kind of the ending. So your faction choice really doesn't make much of a difference outside of how you get to the ending. But nonetheless, there are unique quests for each of the factions that you won't see unless you join them. And before we jump into the combat section, I wanted to talk a little bit about the UI. They've made some updates to the UI. I don't think all of it was positive, though. They changed a lot of the stuff into like these lists, which are harder, in my opinion, to navigate than the original game. I didn't know where else to put that in this review, so there you go. But let's move on to the combat. The combat is the same janky mess that it was in the original game. They did add some new stuff via the jetpack combat. You can pick up some abilities that will let you use your jetpack in combat to attack flying enemies, as there are enemies that are exclusively flying, so you need some sort of ranged capability. And if you're melee, you basically have to go into jetpack combat to attack these ranged enemies in the air. They also added heavier weapons, grenade launchers, something they call a slug thrower, which I think is just meant to be like a heavy ammo. But they added heavier weapons, which are pretty cool, honestly, to use in terms of the damage they'll do and the explosions they'll cause, etc. And the combat, much like the original, comes down to two things, really. And that is what your stats actually are, the equipment, and then the actual combat itself. So the combat is decently challenging just because it's based off of your stats. If you're fighting something that's way over leveled than you, you're going to lose even though it's third person action combat. So you really need to focus on leveling up and getting your character in a good place before you start tackling a lot of combat quests. That said, this game is much better paced on the combat front than the original, as in the original, you were almost useless at level one and you could run into like in-game level enemies just right from the starting area. 
Whereas in this game, they kind of slowly lead you in the direction of quests you can actually complete and monsters you could actually fight. So the game does not feel as difficult as the original did purely because there's a bit more of a attempt, I would say, at pacing the game out quite a bit better than the original. However, it must be said that the combat is pretty rough. The animations are very stiff. And while you can do a lot of cool stuff, a lot of it doesn't look very cool because of the animations behind it. Nonetheless, they did add some new stuff to combat and while Overall, it can be fun, especially if you lean into some of the more new, interesting things like jetpack combat or the heavier weapons that can be a lot of fun. It is nonetheless janky and does not look super great. And in some ways, it's just clunky to engage with. But from there, let's talk companions a little bit. So a lot of the companions are returns from the original game. So we get to see Nasty, Falk, we even get Kaya for a while. We get our personal droid, if you will, crony back. And it seems really what they did was replace two of the companions with two new ones. Every faction gets a companion, basically, as a representative. And they replaced the Berserker and the Alb companion from the original game. So now, instead of everyone's least favorite companion, the Alb, whose name I can't even remember from the first game, we get Naira. And then for the Outlaws, instead of the guy who tried to kill us in the first game, we get Bully. Now, I don't want to spoil all these companions for you, as honestly, I think the companions were some of the best of what this game had to offer. I would say even the companions I didn't like going into the game, their story and actually doing all their quests for them, in most cases, surprised me. And just when a character was starting to get on my nerves, the tone of the game and their quests, I mean, switched and it gave a bunch more context to why things were going on the way they were up to that point. And suddenly characters that were annoying me were actually pretty cool. And I think the game did handle those companions pretty well, or at least their quests. And a lot of them have a pretty solid story arc. Now, with that in mind, it is much easier to piss off your companions in this game than the previous game. As in the original Elix, as long as you did their quest, you were pretty much good to go. However, in this game, if you are basically actively doing things those companions don't like, you can pretty easily piss them off to the point that they'll just leave which was honestly pretty difficult to get to in the first game, but there's definitely some consequences to using the wrong companion and acting a way they don't like. And then, of course, we have romance. So Jax can romance pretty much all of the female companions, which is Kaya, Nasty, and Naira. Now, I would say the canonical romance for this game will likely be Kaya again, and I say that because the only romance that has an achievement tied to it is Kaya. Kaya is, of course, the mother of Jax's son, However, they've had a bit of a rocky relationship since Jax just kind of absent fathered the whole thing for the last six years, which as a father, gotta tell you, not a fan. Now, they did try to expand the romances from the first game a little bit and try to form a more emotional attachment, if you will, through the quest. But I will say the romance largely just boils down to, again, doing things that character likes, picking the romance option when it comes up. And then after that, you can spend time with that companion every once in a while. And again, it's actually a bit more than what was available in the original game, which was basically just a single romance cutscene. So it's better, but still not, you know, great or anything. But let's talk positives, negatives, and wrap this thing up. Now, on the positive side, there's great options for roleplay. I love the ability to join all these factions. I love the unique quests that you only see if you join those factions. There's a ton of replayable content, I think. They definitely tried to expand some things since the original Elix, such as the jetpack combat. I think they tried to make the game a bit easier to follow via the game pacing, making a little more sense than the original. And overall, there's just some quality of life stuff that that if you played the first game, you'll definitely appreciate. Now, on the negative side, let's be honest, it's janky. A lot of it plays very clunky, especially the combat more than anything else. Moreover, there is, despite being more options for roleplay during the story, the story itself ends basically the same way, no matter what you do. And I believe that is simply because they want to set up a third game, as the ending of this game definitely implies a third, in my opinion, which they have done previously. Piranha Bytes has typically released three games for a lot of their series. And rather than have to deal with the issue of picking a canon ending like they had to do with the first game, it kind of felt like they just wanted to make one ending so they could then write their next game based off of that while making it less annoying in theory that you couldn't import a save or whatever from the first game with your ending. And last but not least on the negatives, let's be honest, some of these faces just look ridiculous. My general conclusion for this game is that it is a double-A game for $50 on Steam, and honestly, I think that's a little high. I would prefer to see it at around 40 myself, 
But that said, if you enjoyed Elix, you will likely enjoy this game as it is just an expanded version of a lot of the same stuff. There's a lot more options in terms of the role play, and basically, again, if you liked Elix, you'll like this because it's just more Elix. However, I think when you consider buying this title, you should definitely look out for the fact that there's just a lot of jankiness, especially around the combat. And if that kind of thing particularly gets under your skin, then you definitely shouldn't buy it. But at the end of the day, Piranha Bytes is a developer, again, known for making a very particular style of game. So a lot of this wasn't really a surprise to most of their fans. And while I did personally enjoy the title because I was looking forward to it, $50, in my opinion, does seem a bit steep. I would wait a little bit for that to come down. But that said, I do think it's a great game. And there's a great RPG in there if you are willing to overlook some of the clunkiness that still revolves around Piranha Bytes games. But all of that said, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the review. If you did, please consider leaving a like, commenting, subscribing to the channel. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching again. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.